In this short video, we're going to look at the first of our fundamental theorems, which is Stokes's theorem. Now, let's think back to Green's theorem. In Green's theorem, we had a region D in the xy plane whose boundary was a simple, closed, positively oriented curve C. And then we said that the line integral of the vector field F along the curve C was going to be the same as the double integral over D of the curl of F dotted with K, our unit uh, coordinate vector K. Now, suppose that instead of having a region in the xy plane, we have an open surface in R3, whose boundary is a simple closed curve. So something like this potato ship uh, surface right over here. Now we know that we can find a parametric representation of this curve S. And if U and V are parameters, then the curve S is essentially represented by a plane curve in the U V plane. So it's reasonable to think that uh, we could apply Green's theorem to this parametric representation and come up with a result which would apply to the general surface S. And in fact, that is the case. We won't go through the details, but that is the case. And that's how we come across Stokes's theorem. So we're going to have a piecewise smooth oriented surface that has to be bounded by a simple closed piecewise smooth boundary curve C with positive orientation. Remember, positive orientation is connected to the orientation of the surface by the right-hand rule. So let F be a vector field whose components have continuous partial derivatives in an open region, which contains the surface S. And then we can say that the line integral of the vector field F along the boundary C is the same as the surface integral of the curl of F this is really not the surface integral, I should be more specific. This is the flux integral of the curl of F through the surface S. So let's look at some examples. In this first example, we're going to verify Stokes's theorem for the vector field with component functions 2x minus y, negative y z squared minus y squared z. And our surface S is going to be the upward oriented portion of the unit sphere where uh, Z is greater than or equal to zero. So it's going to be the upper hemisphere of the unit sphere. So the boundary of that uh, hemisphere is the unit circle in the XY plane. And since we're going to have an upward oriented hemisphere, that means that the in the xy plane, the circle is going to be oriented counterclockwise, so it's positively oriented. Now, what does verify mean? Well, in a theorem where you have an equation as the result, uh, the verify means that we're going to evaluate both sides of the equation and show that you get the same result, whether I evaluate the line integral directly, or the surface integral of the curl of f. So let's start with the line integral. So we just have the unit circle. So we'll use the usual parameterization. So x is cosine of t, y is sine of t. And in this case, uh, z equals 0. Well, since z equals 0, then our second and third, so the j and k components of f are going to be zero. And that leaves us with the i component or the i component 
2x minus y becomes 2 cosine of t minus sine of t. Now, our prime of t is just negative sine of t, cosine of t, and 0. And if I dot these two vectors, f of r of t with r prime of t, I just have to be concerned about the product of the first component, of the i component. And so that will give me, what, negative 2 cosine of t sine t plus sine squared t. So let's go ahead and evaluate that integral. t is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. I went ahead and replaced sine squared of t with our identity, 1 half of 1 minus cosine of 2t. Now, when I look at this uh, integral, I see that the first term, I could use a u substitution, and uh, I would get uh, essentially negative sine squared t. And then inside the brackets here, uh, I would get a function of sine. And I can see that both of those antiderivatives will evaluate to 0 when my limits or bounds are 0 to 2 pi. So the only term that matters is the 1 half. And so when I evaluate that, I'll get pi. All right, let's check out the surface integral. I need to use the curl of f, so let's calculate the curl of f. We'll use this determinant memory aid here. And so I'll get, well, for the first component, uh, partial of y um, of negative y squared z, that's negative 2yz, partial of z of negative y z squared, that would be negative 2yz, but I'm subtracting that, so that would be plus 2yz, so that'll give me 0. And the j component, the partial of x of this term is 0, the partial of z of that term is 0, so I got 0 for the j component. And then for the k component, the partial of x of this term is 0. I'll subtract off the partial of y of this term, which will be a negative 1. So that leaves me with the curl of f as a very simple constant vector of 0, 0, 1. So it's actually our k hat unit coordinate vector. All right, we're going to parameterize the hemisphere uh, using x and y as our parameters, since I can write z equals radical 1 minus x squared minus y squared. We've seen this parameterization before, but let's go over the details again. So in order to find ds, uh, I need to know uh, z sub x and z sub y, so the partial of z with respect to x and the partial of z with respect to y. So I'll start with this equation from the equation of the sphere take the partial with respect to x of both sides. I have to use the chain rule here on the left-hand side and solve that for the partial of z with respect to x. I get negative x over z. If I do the same analysis for the partial of z with respect to y, I'll get the negative y over z. And so then my unit vector to this surface, to, to the hemisphere, uh, is just going to be uh, the position vector for the corresponding point on the sphere. Uh, so remember that for a sphere, the normal vector uh, is on the line that passes through the center of the sphere. And so, and it has to have length one. Well, any point, the distance from any point on the sphere to the origin is already 1. So this is going to already be a unit vector. Now, my ds is going to be uh, this expression. And so I'll, I'll replace the 1 with the z squared over z squared. And so then I'll get z squared over z squared plus x squared over z squared plus y squared over z squared. 
So x squared plus y squared plus z squared is 1. So radical 1 is 1. So the top is going to be 1. The common denominator is z squared. And so radical z squared will just be z. So ds is just 1 over z dA. So remember that our d capital S, where is that unit? Ah, here it is. The d capital S is just the unit normal vector times ds. And so if I take this dot product, well, then I'm just going to take x, y, z uh, dotted it with the curl, which is just k. So I'm just going to get z. But then I multiply that times ds. That's 1 over z dA. So I just get 1 dA. So I just need to take the uh, double integral over my parametric region. And the parametric region is going to be in the xy plane because my parameters are x and y. It's just going to be the unit circle. So I'm just going to take the area then. That's just the area of the unit circle, which is pi units. The same answer I got with the line integral. So the line integral is the same as the flux of the curl of f across that surface. All right, so in this next question, we're asked to evaluate a line integral using Stokes' theorem. So that means that what we're going to do is find the flux of the curl of f across a surface whose boundary is the given curve C. So we're given this vector field F and C, our curve is the intersection of the plane X minus 2Y plus Z equals 5 with the cylinder X squared plus Y squared equals 9. So we're not going to actually calculate the equation of that curve because what we're going to do is find the flux of the curl of f across a surface whose boundary is that curve c. So a natural choice would just have be to take the portion of the plane which lies inside that cylinder. So we can go ahead and parameterize the plane using x and y. And then we'll go ahead and calculate the partial of r with respect to x, the partial of r with respect to y. Go ahead and take the cross product. And I get the vector 1, negative 2, 1, and oh, yeah, it's a plane, so we should be able to look at the equation and say, oh yeah, I know what the normal vector is for a plane. I know how to find it. I just take the coefficients on x, y, and z, so 1, negative 2, 1. Okay, but it's good to have the, the verification. We found the same vector in two different ways, so we have a lot of confidence that that is the correct vector. Uh, now, I need to calculate the curl of f, so we'll use this determinant memory aid to help us find that. And we'll get the vector field negative 2z, negative 1, and 6y. So now I've got to take that vector and dot it with my normal vector, the rx cross ry. And I'll get, well, let's see, negative 2z plus 2 plus 6y. Now I'm going to have to replace z with 5 plus 2y minus x. So I have everything in terms of my parameters, which are x and y. So let me go ahead and work out the algebra carefully, remove the parentheses, and co collect the like terms. And now, 
I can evaluate this uh, flux integral, my region R here is going to be the projection of that intersection onto the, or that portion of the plane onto the xy pl plane. And that's going to be a circle with, I'm sorry, actually a disk of radius three. And so uh, since it's a disk, we're going to convert uh, this integral to polar coordinates. So I'm going to factor out the two. That's where this two comes from. Uh, my bounds on theta are going from zero to two pi. It's the whole disk. The radius of the disk is three. So I'll go from zero to three. So x plus y would be r cosine theta plus r sine theta. I factored out the two, so I'd be left with minus four. And then I have my dA, which is r dr d theta. So if I distribute the r and take the antiderivative, I'd have r squared times cosine theta plus sine theta. So take that antiderivative, and I'll have one third r cubed. Take the antiderivative of 4r, and I get 2r squared. I'll have to evaluate that between 0 and 3. And now when I look at this integral, since my uh, bounds go from 0 to 2 pi, when I find the antiderivative of cosine theta plus sine theta and evaluate it between 0 and 2 pi, that's just going to give me 0. So no contribution from this part. The only thing that gives me a contribution is the 2 times minus 18. So that would just be minus 36 of the integral from 0 to 2 pi d theta. So that'll be negative 36 times 2 pi, which is negative 72 pi. In our third example, we're asked to evaluate the flux integral of curl of f across a closed surface. So, and that closed surface is this ice cream cone shaped. It has a, a portion of a sphere and a portion of a cone beneath it. And so, um, and we're going to assume that this closed surface is positively oriented, meaning that its unit normal is pointing outward. So let's just call S1 the bottom part, the cone, and S2 the portion of a sphere. And uh, note that S1 and S2 are both open surfaces, and they share the same boundary, which is this circle right here, the circle where they intersect. Uh, that's actually x squared plus y squared equals 1 half, and the z coordinate is root 2 over 2, or radical 1 half. So S is positively oriented closed surface. So its normal vector is pointing outward. Well, that would mean that for S2, the sphere portion, the normal vector is pointing upwards. The open surface, which we called S2, is upward oriented. But the normal vector, which points out of S for the cone, points downward. So the cone is downward oriented. So I could apply Stokes' theorem to both of these open surfaces. And so I would say the flux of F across S1 would be the line integral of uh, I'm sorry, the flux of the curl of f across S1 would be the line integral of f along the curve C1, which is this circle. And the flux of the curl of f across S2 would be the line integral of f along the same circle, but we need to be careful about the orientation because one of those surfaces is upward oriented 
and the other surface is downward oriented. So C1 and C2 are the same circle, but they have opposite orientations. So how do we come up with that again? How do I know that the uh, that for C1, which is, is the boundary of the cone, why is that oriented this way? And C2, the boundary of the sphere, oriented the other way? Well, that comes from the right-hand rule. If I look at the upward oriented, I put my thumb up, and then the way my fingers would wrap around, that's the orientation of the curve. And then for a downward oriented surface, I point my right hand thumb downward, and then that would, the way my fingers curl, would be uh, the direction of uh, I think I have this drawing wrong. Let me fix that. I just noticed it right now. So let's just uh, get that. It's like my right hand wouldn't go that way. That would be my left hand. So all I need to do is just do a little reflection there. So now that is going to be the right hand pointing downward. And so, uh, that's right. So there we go. Now we've got that right hand pointing downward and the fingers curl in the direction of C1. All right, so, uh, so that tells me that really C2 is the uh, opposite of C1. It's just traversed in the opposite direction. So the flux integral over the entire surface, well, the entire surface is the union of S1 and S2. So I could just sum up the flux integrals over S1 and the flux integral over S2, but those are actually line integrals by Stokes' theorem. So I'd have the line integral over C1 or along C1 plus the line integral along C2, but we just said that C2 is the opposite of C1. So the line integral of F along the opposite of C1 is the same as the negative of the line integral of F along C1 in that orientation. And so now I have the same integral subtracted from itself, which will give me zero. And so you could do this uh, with any closed surface. You can break it up uh, and um, have two open surfaces and apply Stokes's theorem to each of the open surfaces. And so you're going to find that the curl, the flux of the curl of F across any closed surface is going to give you the same result of zero. Now, let's think about this for a minute. We know that if a, the divergence of the curl is zero. Uh, and so, if I have a general flux integral over some given vector field G. Can Stokes' theorem help us evaluate this flux integral? Well, if I know that G is divergence-free, meaning that the divergence of G equals zero, then I should be able to write G as the curl of F for some vector field f, some other vector field f. But the problem is that calculating a vector potential function, so a, a vector field f where the curl of f equals g, can be really challenging. 
if you're interested, uh, you can look at this paper and uh, there is a method presented there, um, which isn't terribly difficult uh, for simple vector fields, but even then, uh, even with that method, it can be very challenging. But we can still make use of Stokes's theorem to simplify some problems. It doesn't really give us the answer, but it just gives us a, a simpler path to finding the solution. And here's an example. So I want to evaluate the flux integral of g across the surface s which is this complicated surface, z equals sine of pi x times cosine of pi y. And um, it's going to be um, on the domain where x goes from negative 2 to positive 2, y goes from negative 3 halves to positive 3 halves. And we're going to orient this surface upward. Now, S is a really complicated surface, um, but it does have a simple boundary because uh, z equals zero along all four sides of its boundary. So it's just the, a rectangle in the xy plane with the, the vertices given here. So we have a very simple boundary, just a rectangle in the xy plane. We have a very complicated surface and we're asked to calculate the flux integral. So normally we'd be stuck trying to find a parameterization, which we could just use x and y as the parameters. But if we look at the partial derivatives of uh, z with respect to x and z with respect to y, they're pretty complicated expressions. I think that we could you know, work through um, and still find the norm, an expression for the normal vector and evaluate the integral, but it would be a lot of work. So I'm wondering if we can simplify this problem by making use of Stokes' theorem. Well, because the divergence of g equals zero, and that's the key to this simplification, we need to have a divergence-free vector field. So if I calculate the divergence, that would be the partial with respect to x of the first term. So that gives me 8xz. The partial with respect to y of the second term is negative 8xz. And the partial with respect to z of the third term is just 0. So the divergence of this vector field g is 0. So there should be some f where the curl of f equals g. And so that would tell me then that by Stokes' theorem, that for that vector field f, the flux integral of g over the surface s would be the line integral of this unknown vector field f around the boundary c. So now suppose that we have a second surface s2 and it has the same boundary curve, so the rectangle here, and the same orientation as the original surface. Well, we could still apply Stokes' theorem because I have the same boundary. That would tell me that the flux of g across this different surface, S2, is going to be the same line integral. So in other words, the flux across the original surface is the same as the flux integral across my other surface, which has the same boundary curve and the same orientation. So in fact, in general, we can say that if we have a divergence-free vector field G and two open surfaces which share the same boundary and the same orientation, then we can say that the flux of G across S1 is going to be the same as the flux of G across S2. Now that kind of statement should remind us of 
independence of path when we had line integrals. But instead of two curves with the same endpoints, we have two surfaces which share the same boundary. So it's not really a terminology that's commonly used, but in a way you could say that this flux integral is independent of surface in that situation. Well, back to our example, how does that help us? So here we have a very complicated surface. The question is, could I find a different surface which has the same boundary, but which is much simpler? And the answer is sure. Why don't we just use the rectangle in the xy plane? The rectangle negative 2 comma 2 cross negative 3 halves comma 3 halves. It's just the in the xy plane, the interior of that boundary rectangle. Then the normal vector to anything that's in the xy plane, the unit normal vector would just be the k unit coordinate vector pointing straight up. And we can easily parameterize the xy plane just using x and y. And so using that parameterization, then our vector field g, because z equals 0, the first two terms are just going to be 0. And then uh, the last term doesn't change. It's just negative 9x squared y squared. It's already in terms of x and y. So now if I take this g and I dot it with my uh, unit normal vector, then I'll just get that term negative 9x squared y squared. Oh, and since we're, we have x and y in the xy plane as our parameters, ds is just dA, which will be dx dy. So then the flux across S2, the flux of g across S2, would just be the integral of negative 9x squared y squared over that rectangle. So I'd have bounds negative 2 to 2 for x and negative 3 halves to 3 halves for y. So fairly simple uh, iterated integral to evaluate. We'll take the antiderivative first with respect to x, evaluate that between negative 2 and positive 2, and then we'll take the antiderivative with respect to y, evaluate that between negative 3 halves and 3 halves. And if I did my arithmetic correctly, that will give us negative 108. So here we can see that uh, we couldn't use uh, Stokes' theorem directly to answer this question, but we could use it indirectly to replace the original surface with a much simpler surface and then find the flux integral using that simpler surface.